All right, what I've got here is a 6BR. So this is an industrial application, 3406E. It's a 14.6 liter, 893 cubic inch engine. Rated at 565 from the factory, if I remember right. Yes. So this being an industrial engine, that means it is not a truck engine and it is not an engine that Caterpillar would have put in one of their pieces of equipment. If it were, it would be classified as a machine engine. So these are used in all kinds of different applications. I've seen them uh, on oil filled pump engines. I've seen them used in farm machinery. I've seen them used in tub grinders, lots of different stuff. I think New Holland even used these in something that they built. I forget what it was. Uh, these are not real common. Don't come across them too much. I think this is only the second one of these that I've ever owned out of, I don't know, two or 300 of these engines I've owned over the years. So I'm not exactly sure what application this one was being used in. It's got this great big compressor on it, which is not very common. And then it's also got this piece that bolts to the flywheel back here. Allows you to direct drive something with the drive shaft right off the flywheel. That's pretty cool. I've always wanted something like that. So anyway, like I was saying, these are not real common. So I came across this thing here a couple of years ago now. It was at a big core supplier that I've bought a bunch of cores off of in the past. And um, they sold it to me as a rotating core. So I brought it home, stuck it in the shop, forgot about it for about a year. And then one day I decided it would probably be a good idea to stick a turning tool in it. Just make sure that it rotates. And sure enough, it does not, it's locked up. So that's not anything that those guys did on purpose. Uh, they're not in the business of screwing people. It was just an oversight on their part. And uh, realistically, I'd have still bought the thing anyway. It wouldn't have changed my mind, so. Not a big deal. I think what's happened here is that somebody pulled the turbo off this thing at some point in the past and then they let it sit out in the rain. It's rusty down in the exhaust manifold there. And uh, there's some rust down in the intake manifold over here too. So I think what happened was it just got rained in and some water ran down in a couple of the cylinders, rusted the cylinders up and that's why it stuck. At least that's what I'm hoping. Hopefully it didn't spin any bearings and screw up the block or the crank or both. So I guess what I'm gonna do is tear the thing apart, see what I've got, see if it's gonna be a good rebuildable core or if it's gonna be a piece of shit. Okay, I've pulled a few coolant fittings and hoses and wires and stuff off of here and noticed a couple things. I think that's a Ritchie Brothers item number right there. So I'm betting what happened was this engine sold in a Ritchie Brothers auction. Somebody bought it. And based on what I'm seeing here, they tinkered around with it, decided they couldn't do anything with it or decided they didn't know what they were doing and then wound up selling it back off to the core buyer that I bought it from. That's just a guess, but it uh, looks like this exhaust manifold has been off here not too long ago. There's some pretty fresh looking markings on some of these nuts. Uh, there's broken off exhaust manifold stud and nut laying right down in there. That one's missing. That one's missing. These two up under here are missing. So I bet they pulled this exhaust manifold off here and we're trying to squirt some lube in those holes or something to get it unstuck. And obviously they weren't successful, but then I have no idea what they were trying to accomplish here. They had this screwed in here. This is a uh, pipe thread reducer fitting that they've got doped up. And that is not a pipe thread hole, that's an O-ring hole. So I don't know. They were probably a little short on brains, looks like. This is one of my favorite parts. I'm gonna pull the valve covers off. All right, here we go. Well, it doesn't look terrible. Looks like the injectors are all gonna be there. Yep. No jakes, obviously, being an industrial engine. Rollers in the rocker arms aren't too terribly bad of shape either.
These high horsepower 6BRs run what I'd call a 55 injector. If you look right down in there at the top of that injector plunger, you might be able to see the 10R0955. Yeah. So if you're not familiar with the slang terms, a lot of guys use for the injectors in these engines, it goes 56, 57, 58, 55, and then 59. And that's an order of low flow to high flow. I guess before I get too much further along here, I'm gonna plug into this ECM. And I'll see how many hours are on it and see what else I can learn about it. All right, I've got my breakout harness connected to the ECM. And that's just a power supply. That's what's powering up the ECM. So I'm already connected to it. The ECM is alive. That's a good start. What do we got here? 3406E Industrial 6BR1004. That matches the tag. 6BR1004. So that's more than likely the original ECM. I figured it was. Looks like it is. Let's see what it's rated at. Selected engine rating, rating number 12, 575 horsepower, 2100 RPM, and 1871 foot-pounds of torque at 1400. So I bet you that's probably the top rating. Let's see what we got here. You don't see too many files with 12 different rating numbers. Rating number 11 is a 565, 1836. That's probably what it would have came out of the factory with. 10 to 5, 65, 18, 36. What's the difference? It doesn't seem to be one, okay. 9 to 5, 50, 8 to 5, 26, 7 to 4, 75, 6 to 4, 51, and so on. All right, what else we got here? ECM identification parameters, equipment ID, serial number 3145. I wonder what that was. Ain't much telling. Okay, let's do what we came to do, which is see how many hours are on it. Total time, 13,790 hours. And these are the log diagnostic codes, so this is the stuff that's happened in the history, you know, going back. So boost pressure voltage high, that doesn't mean anything to us right now. ECM battery powered intermittent, that's nothing. Excessive boost pressure, that's no big deal. That was 90 hours ago anyway. Here's a very high coolant temperature, but that was the last time it happened was uh, about 600 hours ago. It says it's occurred 20 times. First time was at 12,000, so this thing may possibly have been overheated more than once but uh, it's run a pretty good time since that happened last, so who knows, we'll find out. And then we've got an engine overspeed warning, which that ain't no big deal, that's been happening since 487 hours, so I don't know, we'll find out. I'm gonna go ahead and pull this exhaust manifold off here and I'll get the oil filter base, the oil cooler, cooling inlet elbow there and the outlet bonnet and uh, pull this coolant filter off. Come over here and get some of these hoses and stuff out of the way. And then I'll show you where I'm at. Okay, I've got most of the coolant parts and the oil filter base and stuff off this side now. There's the water pump. So, uh, when I pulled this manifold off, there was only, it's supposed to have these sleeves in here in each one of these exhaust ports and that one right there is the only one that i pulled out so three of them are missing so that exhaust manifold has definitely been off somebody had pulled it off like i thought they had um you'll notice i'll try to point out some of the differences between this industrial engine and a truck engine which is more common and something that a lot of you are going to be more familiar with so you'll notice that this industrial engine uses the bigger square port exhaust manifold. And that's pretty standard for any industrial engine or machine engine that's typically set up to run at a higher RPM with a more constant load. Uh, you'll see the bigger port and then uh, you'll see the smaller round port manifold used on something like a truck engine where it's gonna spend more time at a lower RPM and where you need a more responsive bottom end like you do in a truck engine because you're constantly shifting gears. 
So the uh, smaller round port manifold will, will help things come to life faster, help the turbos pull quicker and that sort of thing. So that's the reason for that. Um, another thing here, this timing sensor was broken off. The other, or the end of that sensor is still in that hole right there. Doesn't look like it screwed the hole up, but I'm gonna need to make sure that I get that, that piece out of there without damaging this front cover because this is a pretty special front cover. So the uh, later 6BRs are dual timing sensor engines. The early ones are single timing sensor, but this is a later one, so it has two. So you got the one we just looked at, and then there's another one over here on this side. So this is yet another front cover and another timing sensor set up that you won't find in any truck engine. And it's even different than that machinery application engine back there. So this one uses the older, what I would call the 40 pin cam gear. It really doesn't have anything to do with which ECMs on it. It's really just the older style cam gear. So this is the cam gear that you would find in your 40 pin truck engines though. So it's reading coming in from the side. I pulled the front engine mount off of it and the crank damper and this front pulley set up. So there's all that. Unfortunately, this bolt right here broke off and that goes all the way through the front cover and into the block. There's dowels inside of these two center holes. That's what locates the front cover on the block. So there's no way I'm gonna be able to twist this front cover or anything like that. And there's no way that I'm gonna be able to get it off of here by beating on it or anything because I'll just end up breaking this front cover if it's that stuck in there that it sheared the head off the bolt. So I'm gonna have to drill that out and that may take a while. I cannot believe it. Can you believe it? I can't believe it. That son of a bitch is turning. There ain't nothing that's ever that easy. All right, since I got that bolt out, shouldn't really be anything else that gives me any trouble as far as getting this front cover off. I pulled the peanut cover off, there's the cam gear. Everything in there is looking pretty good so far as I can tell. So I'm gonna come over here to this side now, try to get the rest of this junk off here. I've already pulled the starter and the ECM off there. So I'll get this big ass air compressor out of here and try to get the rest of these uh, sensors and wiring harness off here, dipstick. There's the fuel transfer pump right there. Um, and then I'll start videoing some more once I get all that off. We'll be down to the core of the engine and it'll get a little more interesting. So talking about stuff that's different between this industrial engine and a truck engine right here is another thing. That is a fuel pressure sensor right there. That's something that a 3406E truck engine does not have. A truck engine will have a fuel temperature sensor, which is right there, but not a pressure sensor. And then the other sensors, uh, that is the atmospheric pressure sensor right there. There's the intake air temperature sensor. Uh, that's the boost sensor right there. And then let's see, there is the speed slash timing sensor on this side that would have screwed in right there. You've already seen this one. It was screwing in from the other side right here. Of course, those are both reading off this cam gear. There's a tone wheel on the back side of that. I'll show it to you once I take that off. And then uh, the oil pressure sensor would have been screwed in right here. I've already taken it off. This is an oil rail running down through here. Each one of these plugs is plugging that oil rail. So the only other sensor would be the coolant temperature sensor, which used to be up here, screwed into the regulator housing that I've already taken off from right here, which is laying right here. Uh, there's the oil pressure sensor. There's the coolant temperature sensor. And that would be screwed into the regulator housing right here. That's looking a little better. This compressor's got to weigh 100 pounds. And the oil drain back hole comes out here in the bottom of it. 
and runs into this cast iron brace, runs down through the brace and then runs back into the block right there. Gotta have that brace with this big old compressor. If you didn't, it'd break off up here somewhere because it's so long and heavy. And then that brace bolts onto the block right here. And that hole right there, the big one, is where the oil runs back into the crankcase. That's just an open hole into the crankcase, just like this right here. Looks pretty good and clean in there. And I was pretty happy to see, you can almost tell there's like a water line in there. So there's definitely been some water standing inside of this intake manifold. If you want to call it that, it's cast into the head. But that's a good sign that uh, this thing has had water in it, and that's what I want. There's got to be a reason that it's stuck, and I don't want that reason to be spun bearings. So some of these exhaust ports are really rusty, too. There's been some water in there. So I think my theory is going to end up being right, and it's just going to be rusted stuck. Got the pan dropped off of it. It's got a good rear sump pan on it. It's not cracked or busted or anything. I mean, I know it's facing front sump right now, but... It's got the sump in the other end. It can be turned around and used as a rear sump. That's a good piece right there. And everything's looking good. It's nice and clean, and I don't see any evidence of any carnage in here yet. I'm not going to celebrate till I've pulled all the rod and main caps, but I think I'm going to get lucky on this one. Nothing laying in the pan that's very scary at all. Nothing in the pan at all other than oil and some sludgy looking stuff. So that's good and uh, it sure is nice to tear into a good old original core that hadn't been messed with by 15 different people and cobbled all together. I mean everything I'm taking apart here especially from this point going forward is uh, you know the last time that this was put together was when this engine was built back in the middle of 98 at the Caterpillar factory. Here's a better look got everything off the bottom now. I don't see any evidence that any of the rods or the mains have had a bunch of heat in them, so I'm pretty sure that I don't have any spun bearings, like almost positive. But what has happened is exactly what I thought had happened. There's quite a bit of evidence that there was water in the cylinders. And what'll happen is when you get water in the cylinders, it'll drip down out of the liner, it'll run down the rod, and it'll run out of the liners, and then it'll find its way down in between the bearing shells and the crankshaft. And uh, if that water sits in there long enough, it can make pitting on that crank bad enough to make it unusable. It usually doesn't get that bad, but it can. So I'm about 99% sure the block's gonna be good at this point, And I'm probably 75% sure the crank will be. But you can see that there's definitely some potential rust damage, so I don't know. Another thing I can tell you if you're looking at a core and maybe it's locked up and you're wondering if it has a spun main bearing, one way you can kind of get a clue about that is this Caterpillar yellow paint has a tendency to turn uh, almost a bright red when it gets really hot. So if you look at the sides of this block and right in the area where the tops of the main journals would be uh, on the inside of the block, so that's like right in this area along through here, if you see a bright red spot, that's a pretty good indication that it probably spun a main and spun it really bad. Now, I've seen them where they've spun mains and there are no red spots because it didn't get quite that hot. But if you do see that red, you pretty much know for sure what happened there. I'll show you what I'm talking about here. Uh, it usually turns even redder. You can see it a little bit there. This one's not really getting as bright as I've seen it, but you get the idea. That's about the closest thing to the color I'm talking about. I've got to show you here out of that little test. That torch may have actually been a little bit too hot, but that's kind of what it'll do right there. All right, I'm gonna pull the cam gear off here now. Get ready to do this. Take you a 3816 bolt. For example, one of these in this front cover here.
thread in that hole right there. Now you got a handle. That's what the tone wheel, the speed and timing sensors read off of looks like. Guess I'll pull this front cover off here now. I have to pull this water pump out of here too. That's just these bolts right here. And then that'll come out the back. One thirty-seven eighty-four sixty-six E block. That's uh, it's my favorite, and that's another reason I wanted this engine. Well, this front cover is pretty much just going to jump right off there. Sometimes they fight you, and sometimes they don't. I take, I normally just take a piece of wood and uh, hammer on it there, and get it started coming off. Still a little bit stuck up here on top yet. There we go. I shouldn't have put that washer back on there yet. I don't know why that's so fun, but I really like it. That's what it looks like with the timing gears off of it. So I'll pull these three stub shafts off of here next. There's nothing to that. It's just these nuts and bolts. And then I'll uh, pull this little cam gear adapter. It's just those three bolts there. There's a ring and the adapter piece. And then I'll pull this inner timing plate off. So next time you see it, it'll just be cylinder head and block. I'm going to pull these rocker arms and shafts out of here now. There ain't much to that, especially on these non-jake engines. There's just four bolts in each rocker shaft. There's three main assemblies here. Two cylinders on each assembly. Getting the last of the valve bridges out of here now. All right, only parts left in the head now are the camshaft and the injectors. So the injectors are just held in with one bolt and 
the injector hole down in each one. It's got a match set of 10 R0955s in it. So it's had a set of cat reman injectors at some point in the past. And the camel looks pretty good. I haven't seen anything yet that would make it junk. It could probably be polished and go again. Usually when I build one of these, it just gets a new cam, but I think that one's probably all right. Pulling the injectors out. Only thing left now is the camshaft. I just pulled the rear cam cover off so I can pull it out of the front or the back, doesn't matter. All right, here we go. We're gonna lift it off there. There's the culprit. She's rusted stuck. So I pretty much already had that figured out, but it's good to see. The uh, question we still haven't answered, though, is why did this engine originally come out of service? Because before it got rained in, it doesn't appear that there was anything wrong with it. Head gasket looks good. It wasn't blown anywhere. Spacer plate. Spacer plate gasket. Which is really more like just a metal shim than a gasket. These water ferrules can get stuck pretty hard sometimes. These uh, are what bridge the gap through the spacer plate from the block through to the head for the coolant. All right, well, question answered. Uh, I was just talking about how I hadn't figured out why this engine was taken out of service. I have now. So hopefully it didn't hurt the block. There's a pretty good chance with where that's broken in there that it didn't, but it could have. So it may even be kind of tricky to get the thing apart. One thing I may have going for me here is I've got this coolant inlet. This is normally a coolant inlet on this block, but on this particular engine, they're using the 90 degree elbow, putting it in here at number four. But uh, behind this cover plate is right about where that liner is broken. It's broken right in here somewhere and probably on further down into here. So let me get this cover plate off and see what it looks like behind there. All right, there it is. It's moving. It's not wedged or anything.
I think if I screw around with that enough, I can get that out of there. And I think the block, with this lighting deal ain't working so good, is it? I think the block is just fine. If I can get that liner out of there without screwing anything up, which I think I'll be able to do having this port open here. I'm glad that it was uh, number six liner that did that, not number five, because I wouldn't have any access there. Or all I would have is these two little tiny pipe thread holes to go through. So, uh, yeah, I'll screw around with this and try to get that out of there like that. Okay. So there's the piece of the liner that busted out. All right, so here's what I got to do now. This engine is still rusted and stuck solid. So this is not my first round with this. I've done this plenty of times. And what I'm gonna have to do is get some rust dissolver stuff mixed up, dump it down in each one of these cylinders, and then I'll have to let it sit. This one ain't really that bad. I've had them quite a bit worse than this, but uh, it'll have to sit at least overnight, if not, maybe you know 24 hours i've had to let it sit in some of them before for as long as three days to get them moving but i don't think this one's quite that bad now, there's a reason that i've left this flywheel housing on here this whole time and that's because i know i'm gonna have to use a turning tool in order to try to get this thing moving uh, there's no better way to get leverage on one of these and get it broke free than with a turning tool because you've got a little bitty gear going in this hole turning a great big flywheel back here and you ain't going to get more leverage on that crankshaft any other way than that. This is about 10 or 11 hours later. So I got the turning tool in there. Let's see if it's gonna move. Oh yeah. Still pretty tight, but it's moving. This stuff's been in here about 16 hours now. So I'm gonna get the vacuum and suck these cylinders dry and I'll squirt them down with some WD-40 and uh, get ready to knock the rods and pistons out of it and get it the rest of the way apart. All right, I dropped this drive shaft adapter rig out of here, out of the flywheel. So this is just kind of a snug interference fit between this outer ring on here and this in here in the flywheel. It's got pusher holes to push it out of there. And I'm pretty sure that I rethreaded those from metric to standard when I pushed that out of there. But that's all right. Uh, that Caterpillar flywheel uses a standard bolt. So this thing needs to too. And uh, pretty sure that it wasn't made anywhere around here because I don't really understand any of that. Looks German to me. Um, another thing you'll notice difference here between this industrial engine and a truck engine. Flywheel housing, of 
of course, in a truck application is made out of aluminum because weight is a pretty major consideration in a truck application. It's not such a consideration in an industrial application, so you would prefer the heavier duty and more durable iron flywheel housing in the industrial application. You get all that? piston cooling jet you don't want to bend those you want to take them out before you start screwing with that rod and piston Bearings don't look too terribly bad. There's number one through six in order. They all look about the same. All the bearings looked about the same too. They were due to be changed, but nothing too bad. All the rod journals look really good. There's a little bit of water marking on the outer faces on some of these journals, but that ain't no big deal. That'll clean right up. And that's not a load bearing surface anyway. So I guess I'll pull the crank out of it now. I'll pull that crank out of the block with it sitting just like that. I'll pull number one, two, and three main, leave number four, pull five, six, and seven. And then I'll come in and take some weight off the crank. Then I'll pull number four. Uh, number four is where the thrust bearing is. And then I'll walk that crank right out of the block. Well, things have uh, taken a turn for the worst here with the crank. Several of these mains are in pretty bad shape. There's quite a bit of water damage. And I'm pretty sure that it's not gonna clean up with just polishing. I mean, I've been surprised before, but I don't know, this one's pretty bad. Seriously doubt that's gonna clean up. So uh, it'll probably have to be ground, either that or I'll just put a different crank in it, but Either way, not the end of the world. Only thing left to do now is pull the liners out of it. I've still got this little problem here. So I'm gonna try to bust the rest of that little piece out of there. And if I can get that out of there, there shouldn't be anything left to hang up on the block as that liner comes out. I think the problem is that uh, a little bit of that is hanging up in the lower part of the block. So what I can do is go ahead and start pulling on this liner and pull it up out of here a little ways and then bust that out and then pull it the rest of the way out. Uh, 
Now this liner won't quite come out of there. It's wanting to grab on that little piece like I thought it would. There we go. Now. This liner split all the way from the top to the bottom. You can see the crack there starting. Coming all the way down through here. And uh, right out the bottom. The good news is the block looks just fine. Didn't hurt it a bit. Got them all out of there. Box in real good shape. I don't think it'll even have to have lowers at the machine shop, which will save a pretty good chunk of money. All in all, pretty good core. The crankshaft could have been a little bit better, but that's all right. It's just a crank, I got more of them. It's all here, it's complete. And this is a desirable enough engine that there's a pretty good chance one day it'll go back together as a 6BR and it'll go again. So I guess that's all I got for this one. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.